scene view, uh, with GUI elements, which is the old method of creating GUIs in Unity, you can see them in your game view if you have like have, have your scene view showing it's, say, it's the same same time as the uh, game view. But the problem is if you have multiple screens like we do, you have to make sure all the other ones are disabled before you can preview the screen that you're working on, which gets a little tedious. Uh, and with the on uh, the GUI API method, which is the relatively newer system of making GUIs in Unity, you can only see that at runtime because they're based on calls that you make in your on GUI method that only execute at runtime. Uh, and with the 3D GUI, because they're just 3D objects, you can see them in your CPU and you can move them around very easily. Um, can you go back one slide? Sure. And the obvious other uh, thing about 3D GUIs is that it's very easy to place them because you know what your camera's uh, viewport is like and you can move it around in a 3D plane. And it's actually very easy to rotate them. So Alex was talking about a speedometer. If you want a needle to spin like this, it's very easy to make that happen with a 3D transformation. Uh, but it's actually not as easy uh, with the other two other systems. With the GUI element, it's not impossible to do it. With the on GUI method, uh, you can do it, but you have to deal with matrices and some type of functions. And it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Uh, but implementing this system did come with some drawbacks. Uh, we had to implement the whole GUI interaction functionality ourselves. So the GUI API, you just make a call like GUI.button, GUI.label, and it automatically handles all the button clicks for you. Uh, but in our case, we had to write our own button class and we had to write our own uh, scroll view class uh, to make any of this work. But we had uh, experience with that before, so it wasn't too much of a problem for us. The second problem is displaying pixel-perfect graphics on screen. So when you're just putting textures on top of the 3D plane, uh, the, basically the 3D scale of the plane gets in the way of knowing how many pixels it's going to end up being on the screen. And you can do calculations, but if you're trying to position stuff and you're trying to do this in your mind, it doesn't work out. Uh, so if you have a texture by 200 by 32 and you want to appear exactly 200 by 32 pixels on the screen, how are you going to end up doing that? It's going to be a lot of tricky calculations, but obviously this can be easily solved with an editor script that you write that automates this process, which we actually have and we're going to hand, uh, we're going to be making available on our site later on. And uh, as I said, being a multi-platform title, we had to have some kind of resolution independence. And resolution independence doesn't necessarily mean having just one system and making it work in all resolutions. You do have to handle some special cases. Um, so one obvious thing is aspect ratios. Uh, the most common aspect ratios that we run into today are 16 by 10, 16 by 9, 4 by 3. And what we do with our 3D GUI system is that depending on what aspect ratio is being used right now, we just move certain objects um, to, a, to a different position uh, with our platform-specific scripts. And that you know, happens on Awake and it get, gets taken care of automatically. Um, and the other thing you have to do is compensating for small screen sizes. So my iPod Touch has a resolution of 480 by 320. It's a very tiny screen. So to make your 3D UI work in such a small screen, you have to make some special adjustments, move, move certain things around and, you know, squish certain elements and make certain elements bigger. And especially for buttons, you have to make your colliders a little bigger than the actual graphic itself because we're, you know, touching the screen with our stubby fingers we actually have to be able to hit that button. So you have to make some special case uh, arrangements for that to work properly. So uh, I'm going to cover quickly some issues with uh, textures in a 2D game. So the most common question we get about 2D games in a 3D engine is why does everything look like a blurry piece of shit? Um, and that's pretty much, that's, that's what will happen if you just throw a bunch of textures or planes in front of a camera and try to make a 2D game out of it. So there's a couple solutions to those. The first is make sure your textures are imported properly for what you're trying to do. So, if you have a texture that's supposed to be pixel perfect, as we call it, or one to one, then you want to turn off mip maps. So anything that's not going to be scaled on screen or be shown at any size other than its pixel perfect size, turn off mips. Uh, same with filtering. Bilinear filtering is great, and it's pretty much in any 3D engine. Um, but what it's doing is it's interpolating pixels, and so you want to turn that off for a one to one texture. Otherwise, you're going to get that blurry effect. Um, so, Yomaz was saying, how do we get a texture that's 200 by 30, for example, to show up at exactly 200 pixels by 30 pixels on screen at any device, at any size, no matter what. And so, um, Yomaz came up with a quick editor script. You hit Control shift t or whatever the P command is, and it scales the plane that the texture is on to the size of the, the pixel dimensions. And so, that's assuming you're using a standard orthographic camera, but with the right numbers, that will that'll work every time. And so, it scales it using those planes we were talking about, giving you giving yourself the, the setup to have six planes oriented at zero scale, or you know, one, one, one scale, helps you get something like this working 
which is really, really it was essential for, for making the game look right. Because our artist would hand us something that was an you know, n pot scale, which is a non power of two scale. So we need to get you know, 384 by 261, a plane that's that size. It's just it's a pain in the ass, so you just hit one key and it scales to that uh, scale, and we're going to give that script out for free on our website, and it'll be up tonight. Um, so another thing for blurry, shitty textures. Um, texture compression. So the age-old question of disk space and memory size versus quality. Uh, so you can't get around it. On iOS, you have a compression scheme called PBRTC. It's not because Unity chose to use this compression scheme or something like that. The hardware uses this compression as its only image compression scheme. It's called PBRTC. So in PBRTC compression, gradients look horrible. But if you have a texture that uses few amounts of colors, so um, you know, you're keeping to a, a limited palette, you're probably not going to see the effect of the compression. Um, but here's a tip for iOS developers, or if you're in Unity and your compression's really looking bad, what you could do sometimes is, instead of trading off to fully uncompressed, which might be way too big for you, take the texture size and double it, and then compress it. Um, and sometimes that'll minimize the effects of the blockiness that you get from compression. And so you might be able to have a, a <coughs> middle ground in, in quality right there. Um, when it comes to PC and Mac, you get a compression scheme called DXT, so they don't use PVRTC. That's because modern graphics cards will, will take DXT compression. It doesn't look nearly as bad as PVRTC. In fact, we were able to take all of our textures in Smuggle Truck and compress them across the board in DXT compression, and you can't see the difference. Or you can't unless you're, you know, zoomed into an unreasonably high level. Do you have a question? Um, were you going to address alphas? Yeah, I'm, I mean, so every, almost every texture in our game is using alpha. So this whole you know, thing about gradients kind of applies to alphas too. So if you want a smooth edge to your, to your sprite, then that's, that's a gradient, but it's really just an alpha gradient. So the same thing is that you're going to get chunkiness, you're going to get blockiness when you try to do PBRTC compression. So the double sizing trick does help with alpha. Um, and you can go uncompressed on things that you really have to weigh your decisions very, very carefully. So if you're developing an iPhone game and you want to keep under 20 megs for your over-the-air limit, um, you're going to say, OK, uh, everything uncompressed is 50 megs. Now what can we start compressing to get under that limit? You want to take you know, large backgrounds, things that exist far away. Like your main character, your, you know, your truck sprite should look as good as it can because it's going to be on the screen in front of you at all times. But then something you're passing by you know, at high speed, like a tree or whatever, you can go ahead and compress those. So it's really just a balancing act of looking OK enough and keeping under your file size. What about anti-aliasing, especially for alphas? So I mean, that's one of the reasons there's not a lot of 3D games on the older iPhone devices, is that you're at 480 by 320, that's your resolution. And 3D edges, there's no anti-aliasing built in. They recently added some software anti-aliasing, but I'll keep that out. Basically, a 3D model turned sideways, you're just going to see that stepping. And there's no way to get around it. But when you're using a 2D game, or when you're making a 2D game like uh, using sprites, all of your alphas are, are the thing that you're seeing on the edge. So that you don't have any aliasing issues, and you get to paint in exactly how you want the edges to look. So for the most part, 2D games look better on the iPhone than 3D for that reason. So um, back to the question, the, really the biggest question we had for this whole project is, how do you handle iPhone, iPad, Mac, PC resolutions, textures, all in one project, without unnecessary content in each build? So if you have an iPad texture, 1024 by 768, and you do an iPhone build, you don't want that huge texture it taking up part of your 20 megs. So how do we deal with it? Well, we had to, we had to build something for that. And it, um, I'm going to call it the Texture Auto Awesomizer. Um, so that, that's a code name for it. Um, so what this does is it maintains four separate builds for us. It maintains our iPhone, our iPad, our web player, and our standalone build. Um, and that handles all the multiple aspect ratios that could be there. And um, you have some textures that might be, this has to be a texture only for iPhone. Or this texture uh, for iPhone should be the iPad version, but scaled in half. There's lots of different ways you can, you can work with all these different assets and not have four copies of every single texture. And uh, so I'm going to show exactly how we do that and how that works and why we feel like this is a pretty good solution and what we went with. Um, so the first part of this auto-awesomizer auto is making this XML 
which defines all of the textures in the game and what their compression and how it's scaled down and what the MIP settings are per texture. So you can see here, for example, we have our iPhone uh, section. We have a texture called activate.png, and it's set to a max size of 128. So built into Unity, they have this feature, which is awesome, where you could say, hey, I want this texture, which exists at you know, 2,000 by 2,000. I want to say its max size should be 128 for this build. So when you build it out, it actually internally compresses that to 128, makes a new asset, puts it into the pipeline. You don't have to deal with an iPhone version of it, or, and an iPad version, and a PC version. You just have one and some settings for that texture. So that's how that works. The second part is our platform specifics class, which you actually attach to an object and say, I would like a custom position, or a scale, or a custom texture, or a custom font, or a custom text on that font for that object. So I'm going to show exactly how that works. Um, I'm going to show a demo of that in the main menu. <laughs> So, stop that. Okay, so the simplest way I could show it is in the main menu. So let's go back over here. So here's our starting screen, splash screen. And on the iPhone, there's no level editor. So this button right here just needs to go away when you're building an iPhone build. So how do you do that? We have our platform specifics class right here. I'm going to zoom in. So, in this case, all we have to do is say, okay, I'd like a restrict platform, and I'd like it to just be standalone only. Done. So at runtime, when, it, when the game says, you know, awake, it's going to actually delete or destroy this object at runtime. Actually, what we're doing for the iPhone build is that we're applying these settings during build time so that none of the assets that are possibly linked in here, don't, they don't get included in the build at all. So all of these are, are applied and then taken away, stripped away from the theme to minimize as much as possible. <coughs> But in standalone, where you can have different aspect ratios and there are a lot of other variables to play with, these are left in the scene so that they can do their job at runtime. There you go. That's a better explanation of how that works. Um, so yeah, th this is pretty simple. We're just uh, destroying this little button right here. Now, the select level button and the credits button, now they're going to be too high, right? Because now you've deleted a button and you had a nice layout and it looked good and it was positioned where you want it. But now you've removed a button. So, And your screen size is going to be tiny on the iPhone. So let's zoom up those button sizes and move them to the right spot. So that's also in this platform specifics class. So uh, for the button I've selected, which is select level, what we're going to do is on iPhone and iPhone Retina, we're going to scale these to the aspect ratio that is 3 by 2. Um, and we're going to move them uh, down and slightly over. And so what that's going to do is, is for the iPhone, it's going to actually move those into the right spot so that we don't have a scene that is main menu for iPhone, a scene that's main menu for iPad. It's just one scene, it's just one set of textures, and then we're doing all this all this change, uh, as you said, at compile time, right? And also some runtime stuff. So the combination of that makes it very powerful for us. Um, and even stuff in the tutorial where it says, tap the screen to continue, that you can't write that on a PC build, right? It has to say, hit space to continue. So that actual text, we could go in here and say, you know what, I'd like to change the text mesh for standalone to say, you know, press space or something. So it'll override the text that you had on there for the platform. And so when we're running in Brass Monkey on the wireless control, it'll say press activate to, you know, to continue. So all those changes are happening in this one class, the platform specifics class that, that we uh, came up with. 